What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Overwatch League Report. I'm your host, Tamor, filling in for Brian uh, yet again for another week. And uh, But I'm joined, as usual, by the trusty as always, Ben. How's it going? It's the, the week of the, the 4th of July here in the United States of America. And uh, I guess <laughs> technically it's the 4th of July around the world, but nobody else cares. Yeah, uh, especially... The week leading into the Atlanta homestead. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about stage three, week four. For the most part, a little bit underwhelming. I mean, we saw a lot of blowouts. There were a few games I went to five, which was which was really fun, and there were some, uh, you know, upsets which we were not expecting. Um, so I feel like, namely, we should we should talk about uh, LA Valiant going 4-0 against uh, London Spitfire. I don't think anyone was expecting that. I mean, London hasn't been playing too well uh, lately, but yeah, that was... Uh, I don't know. What'd you think? Yeah, I mean, that was that match was very uh, very embarrassing for the uh, for the Spitfire, but the Spitfire, uh, like you mentioned, have been on a downturn, and the Valiant have been on an upturn. Uh, and uh, so... If he, I guess we, in, in hindsight, we shouldn't have been so uh, surprised, but it mm. definitely was much more of a blowout than uh, than I expected. The Valiant uh, just came in with London's number, uh, and uh, they've uh, they've really done a good job of putting uh, people like uh, Shax and Fact Fiction to work. Some of these new players, um, and it's uh, it's been working out really great for them. Yeah, and we also did see the the return of Nuss, um, which uh, he he actually had a really sad message on Twitter after the game, uh, and I just want to quote it here. He said, "I think I've disappointed more than impressed so far this season. We'll get some rest and reset for next stage. We'll come back stronger for sure." GG's San Francisco shock. Yeah, it's kind of. I mean, it's it's sort of a reality check, I think, for this team who won the inaug- inaugural season. Um, you know, and I do think that's important. Get getting some rest and kind of reanalyzing things uh, in the current meta. And uh, it, but it is sad to see, you know, one of our favorite players in this like this uh, depressing little moment. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Nuss has been uh, kind of riding the bench this stage in favor mm-hmm. of their new player Quatermain, and he did come back this week, uh, and they did uh, lose. Uh, every single map this week, they went 0 and 8 in maps. I don't think that was really Nessa's fault so much. Uh, it was just kind of a coincidence that mm-hmm. this happened to be the week that he came back. Um, yeah, I mean, they definitely uh, need to uh, to reevaluate and come back stronger in uh, in stage four. Uh, one of the things, you know, he pointed out there were a lot of blowouts uh, this week uh, compared to other past weeks, even just this stage. A lot of that, I think, has to do with the fact that a lot of teams are really moving towards uh, these DPS-heavy compositions. We even saw Vancouver running uh, a quad DPS double support, no tank composition on uh, on Hollywood against the Gladiators and just totally rolling with it. And it had uh, a bumper on Junkrat and just like uh, Stitch and Sumsu in the lineup uh, with Janu taking out and just like these kind of compositions tend to lead to more uh, polarized uh, matchups than uh, the Goat's Mirror, which is kind of more, uh, you know, random. Not not random, but more more like even, where like teams uh, are just going to win off of these small margins, and like it's going to come down to the wire every single time and be, be very close and mm-hmm. can kind of go either way. Whereas with the the DPS compositions, it's a lot easier for uh, the more uh, capable team to just kind of roll with them. And since we're seeing a lot more of that, uh, those kind of uh, those kind of comps being run, then I think that that's that's kind of a leading reason. It, I mean, there were a lot of polarized matchups this week as well, but I think that's also a, a, a big reason why we saw a lot of these uh, kind of one sided matches. Yeah, that's a great point, and and as you mentioned, with uh, the Titans uh, switching up their roster, I think that's a really interesting thing to observe. Just because you know, with, when they lost to the Valiant, we all I felt like we were all sort of like, are they gonna be able to keep up with you know the shifting meta where they just like the best team 
for the goats part as San Francisco's sort of kind of looking uh, like. Um, you know, San Francisco lost to Chengdu uh, this week, which Chengdu's the sort of team, they're always mixing it up, and they're always, I mean, they're one of the most fun teams to watch just because they're, like, totally random with their heroes, or at least it seems that way to us. Um, and as we saw, they came out ahead, and I think that I think that goes into it, you know? San Francisco may not be as practiced in this shifting meta. Yeah, I think this is something that a lot of uh, people and analysts predicted preseason were that uh, uh, San Francisco did have a lot of the capability uh, to perform well uh, with goats, and we saw a lot of their uh, their success come from composition. Even through uh, this stage, they've done very little uh, experimentation. Uh, they've like thrown Sombra in here and there. They've done, you know, some other weird things with Rascal, but like for the most part, they've run way more goats than uh, every other team at this point. Uh, and it's it's strange because they do have a lot of um, uh, depth on their roster. They have, you know, Striker and Evix and these people like sitting on their bench. So mm. like, the, there there is the capability for them to to kind of play these more DPS focused comps uh, if they want to. I think the main issue is that there's still a lot of like fall back onto goats and so they don't want to be forced to play these players who aren't as uh as versed on uh heroes like zarya uh and then have to be forced onto goats by the other team uh on like a second point or something like that and just be unable to uh keep up so it's it's very tricky because they have these players that are like so very very good in their individual roles. I mean, like you know, Sinatra's incredible right. on like every role he's put on, um, especially uh, Zarya. But like, mm -hmm. it's still it's still very tricky when they, they it seems like they put so much time into uh, into perfecting uh, this one composition that's kind of uh, falling a little bit in popularity. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate for them, but I think it's a little more fun for us to watch. Um, oh, absolutely! I mean, yeah. <laughs> we got like Torb Jorn Hammer kills this week. Yeah, and, like, yeah. Can't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Um, but like we did mention, there were some uh, very close games, and a lot of them, you know, a lot of teams went to five. For example, uh, Dallas Field versus NYXL. This was a really close game, and Dallas they really they looked really strong. You know, granted they did. They did lose in the end, um, but I, 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 it's nice to see them improving. Yeah, they um, they came out. They put uh, Taimu in their starting roster uh, for this week in that match. Uh, Taimu, kind of a controversial figure within the uh, within the Overwatch scene, mm -hmm. um, and it worked out for the the first two maps, and then uh, they kind of fell apart on Hollywood. And then they took Taimu out. They went back to this kind of like uh, old standby situation. Uh, they like played uh, note uh, less uh, on the uh, the Zarya role. They kind of like put AK, uh, AKM back in so they could kind of flex more easily between goats and DPS comps. And then they got reverse swept because uh, New York was still able to outplay them. Um, so I mean, definitely showing more capability than they have in recent weeks but it's it's still uh it's still hard uh to see uh if the fuel have uh the fuel left in them to really ride out the rest of the season yeah it's i i don't know i i'm i'm not too confident in that i i, I would like to see them succeed but i don't know it's getting quite late in the season <laughs> um yeah. Uh, the other the other match that was really interesting to me that went to five was uh, Boston versus Philly, which was quite close. Um, um, with unfortunately Boston kind of throwing on Lighthouse. What do you think of this uh, this this match? Yeah, definitely uh, a lot closer than the last match from a couple of weeks back of Boston versus Philly, where the second half of the match Philly just kind of you know rolled and full held Boston on both points as we had talked about. Uh, this match like could easily have gone either way. Uh, a couple of the individual maps were, you know, a little bit one-sided here and there, but the match overall uh, definitely uh, was um, kind of uh, contentious, possibly. 
uh, and uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, the final uh, the final map of Ilios, uh, Boston really uh, just took control on ruins. Uh, Philly really dominated on well, and then when it came to Lighthouse, which was the second point, but like the most uh, uh, the closest of the uh, the three points in that map, uh, you know, Boston kind of fell apart in the second half of that point. And they kind of like threw away a, a match win that they could have they could have easily won that point two or three separate times, uh, and they just kind of gave it up and let Philly take it um, with like you know a number of uh, just kind of glaring mistakes. Uh, and so they have Boston definitely has been improving. Uh, Philly is still struggling, but they're starting to improve as well. And this is kind of uh, you know. Uh, a story of two teams that are trying to find their footing and just like, you know, they're, they're both making mistakes and it's just kind of like which team is just making the fewest mistakes in this match is what it seemed to come down to. And so it'll be interesting to see if these teams continue an upward trajectory going forward. Um, this was the, uh, the, uh, the final map, uh, the final match of the stage for Boston, but Philadelphia is playing two matches next week in, uh, in Atlanta. So uh, and yeah. they they have like a very narrow window. We'll talk about a little later to get into the stage playoffs. Um, so we'll see if they can make that happen. If they can't, then at least they can hopefully um, propel themselves uh, into a more favorable favorable position in a, in a potential uh, season playoff setup. Yeah, exactly. And I I really want to see Boston up there <laughs> um, and yeah, Philly as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're both teams that I, I really, I really like. You know, there's there seem to be a few other teams that have just risen to the occasion uh, as we're, you know, going into stage four and you know throughout stage three. Um, so I want to talk about them. Like for example, Valiant and Outlaws. These are teams that were basically at the bottom of the the roster um, at the beginning of the season. And yet now here they are heading into the stage playoffs. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 interesting seeing these guys. In, in, in my head, I feel like I'm still viewing them as like you know the bottom third, uh, whereas like Philly and Boston, these types of teams to me are like mid to you know like Boston. They they were they were in the stage one playoffs, and it's. Yeah, no, it's interesting seeing this sort of shift in a lot of these teams, and I guess, you know, they're making the right changes. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's very, uh, like, we talked a little bit at the, about the Valiant at the start when, uh, with their 4-0 against London, but, I mean, it's, it's very surprising when you think about, like, the Valiant went 0-7 in Stage 1, the Outlaws went 0-7 in Stage 2, and now these are two teams who are both in the Stage 3 playoffs, and both potentially making a run for the season playoffs, which is not something I would have expected uh, mm. after either of those stages based off of those teams' uh, performances. Um, and yeah, they've they're, they've definitely turned around. Uh, Houston has uh, found their footing uh, with, uh, you know, kind of building themselves a little bit more around Dante and Dante Sombra and these like more DPS heavy cheese compositions. Mm. Uh, the Valiant have, uh, as I mentioned, you know, made some good pickups uh, with Fact Fiction and uh, Shax. So, like, they, they've, they you know, when you look at, like, for instance, like, I mentioned this a couple of times already, this stage since the trade happened, but, like, the Valiant made out way better in their trade versus uh, uh, their trade with Mayhem. Like, the Mayhem are still a, a bottom-tier team, yeah. if not the worst team in the league. <laughs> and, like, yeah. even though even though the Mayhem did beat the Outlaws, I mean, the, they're still, like, there's no way the mayhem are making the season playoffs. So like yeah. the the mayhem gave up their uh, academy team and they got basically nothing for it. They got fate who is like marginally better than Swan was. And the Valiant kind of just made out like bandits and uh, are, uh, are now kind of, you know, potentially finding themselves in this uh, end of season uh, play in bracket. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, speaking of, let's talk about next week. I feel like, you know, speaking of Florida Mayhem, I feel like the the one role that they play right now is, like, you know, keeping NYXL in, uh, in contention for the playoffs. 
and kind of giving Atlanta like a big win for the like Atlanta crowd. Hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully. that's kind of their role. I you know you have to wonder if this is like planned out because. Oh, yeah, so, you, gotta so, ima- you gotta imagine, yeah, the- yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like let's look, let's look at the uh, the matches for the homestead because we have we have a lot of you know bottom tier teams, and then facing off a lot uh, against a lot of strong teams, you know, um, NYXL versus Toronto Defiant, and then Florida Mayhem. It's like I feel like these are gonna be cinches for them. Uh, what else do we have? We have Atlanta versus they're like we mentioned fa- facing Florida. And Toronto, um, again, both yeah. very doable matches. We have Philly facing Washington and Shanghai, and Washington, I think, goes without saying that's a, that's you know a very doable match. But Shanghai, I feel like this is this is going to be the match to me that uh, is definitely the one to watch. This is the oh, sure, going to be yeah. the closest. And as you mentioned earlier, um, this is the sort of thing where this match will definitely decide whether Philly or Shanghai uh, go into the playoffs. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, what what the points would need to be for each team for them to stay in or to get into the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, just like straight up. Obviously, the, the homestead is really exciting. The the Dallas homestead was really awesome. The, the yeah. crowd was really hyped. But, I mean, just looking at these matches, the only interesting match for me is, is Fusion versus Shanghai. Yeah. Um, yeah, so going into the stage playoffs, we have six out of the eight teams uh, clinched in. The only two teams that, like, potentially could not make the stage three playoffs are New York and Shanghai. And the only team that can replace one of those is Philadelphia. And so New York just has to maintain a an above a minus four map differential uh, across matches against the Mayhem and the Defiant. And I, I I would be immensely shocked, immensely shocked if like literally if they four zero or if they three one the uh, the Mayhem. Like they're in. If they right. three two the mayhem, they're in. Like the, like they would have to lose to both teams by like two. They would have to like lose three mm. one to both teams, or like lose three two to one and four zero to the other. Like mm-hmm. it's just it's just so unlikely that we can basically call the Excelsior in. Yeah. Like it's 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 not gonna happen. Like I I would stake any amount of money on the Excelsior. <laughs> Yeah, I say that, and then, you know, there's going to be too crazy. Episodes, I know, right? Um, so, yeah, the, the really interesting thing is Shanghai and Philly. So, Philly has to win both of their matches, and Shanghai has to lose both of their matches in order for Philly to move up. But gotcha. one of the matches for both of them is them playing each other. So, that's only three matches that have to have a certain outcome, and mm-hmm. one of them is Philly versus the Justice, which theoretically should be a win for uh, Philadelphia. So basically, the Philadelphia's path into the playoffs, into the stage three playoffs, is beating Shanghai and then Shanghai also losing to the charge, which isn't impossible, but it's not likely. So right. I think we're still probably seeing, like I think I mentioned to you before, I think it's probably about 90% uh, likelihood that Shanghai is the team that mm-hmm. gets in. Um, and, you know, that'll be, uh, that'll be really fun. Um, yeah, and I think deservedly so. so. They've been playing very strong, uh, oh, for sure, yeah. just uh, overall this whole season. And I guess just to play devil's advocate, let's you know. So you know we're in we're in, in Atlanta. Let's look at like the small details, maybe things we wouldn't pay attention to. You know, we're in a different location. Maybe that affects mm-hmm. how teams play. NYXL also playing at eleven thirty a.m. Atlanta uh, region, t- uh, you know, Georgia time. Um, and remember, I think it was last week they played against someone and they were, they were looking really weak at first and it was like, why are they doing so poorly? And then in the interview afterwards, I forget which player it was, but he was like, yeah, we just, we were like really tired because this is like the first match of the day. And then I think it's like, what, what yeah, time is it in it's noon? It's like noon in, uh, yeah. um, yeah, so this, this would, this would be 8 30 AM pacific time like so if they're if they're like jet lagged coming in mm. uh, and they're like not acclimated to the uh eastern time uh then yeah they would be it would be like they're playing at uh 8 30 in the morning which right. is incredibly early for you know 
uh, pro <laughs> Overwatch players <laughs> for who, gamers <laughs> who probably stay up until three o'clock in the morning most nights at the very least. So yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a possibility of fatigue. Uh, whether there's going to be enough fatigue for them to like lose against the mayhem is seems unlikely. Yeah, uh, I guess but, I'm just trying to make these yeah. matches oh, yeah, more yeah, interesting. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I, mean, um, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so other than that, I mean, I think Atlanta's going to look really strong in front of their home uh, home crowd. DeFran okay. is playing against, uh, uh, what's his name? Bran. Uh, uh, well, there's also talk about, uh, I think it was, it, was it, was it, was it short, short for he's playing? There's something about a Torb hammer off or something oh. like against short for with DeFran. Uh, I'll double check to see if it works. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be um, hilarious. I yeah. feel like they're gonna try and milk Defran as much as possible because he's oh, like he's still technically yeah. part of the team, right? He streams for yeah, them or he's something still like that. Franchise with them as a streamer, but he's not yeah. on the Overwatch League team. Um, so I mean, you know, I, like coming in, we knew that like the Rain brand was gonna be heavily tied to Defran because you know they probably invested a lot into uh, into him, into into his fan base, etc. To try and kickstart you know because coming in as an expansion team you need some like the all of the people who are overwatch league fans like probably already had a team that they were rooting for at least tacitly in the first um mm. season so if you're coming in as an expansion team in season two you need some like something to grab onto to like say like these kind of you know bandwagony fans like these fans that were kind of just like mm. watching them have fun you should like be able to have something for them to grab onto and the fran for sure was that uh for the, definitely for the rain i'm trying to think if there was anyone else for any of the other uh newer teams does anyone else come to mind um no i mean uh you know uh, Hangzhou had their like anime reference in their hot right. pink uniforms. You know, uh, Chengdu kind of had their like wacky, uh, like wacky, like retired players coming out, and then like their crazy compositions that were like uh, you know uh, off meta. And so, like right. they're you know Toronto kind of has like this underdog feel. The run, yeah, the runaway, yeah, exactly. <laughs> before yeah, the they away, before they like. Had, Oh, go, go ahead. <clears throat> no, that's, I mean, just you can yeah. name off every single team. They all have something, right? Yeah, Paris is like the, the EU team because, like, the old, like, mm. London is like a team full of Koreans. And, like, you know, that's right. great if you were a fan of them before they joined the Overwatch League. But, like, if you're like a European Overwatch fan, like, there's no, there was no team for you that you had, like, that team identity of, like, I'm an EU Overwatch fan. Yeah. But oh, like, totally. Paris came along and took that mantle. So, like, yeah. yeah, and zero Korean players, although who knows how well that's working. I, that's not obviously the reason why. But, <laughs> right, yeah. but like, um, yeah, it's it's look like the branding, right? It's all, like, yeah, all, all totally. every team had some branding to them. You know, Washington had the branding of being bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I suppose you're right. That was the first ever Overwatch League uh, report video <laughs> was just talking about how they were going to be bad. And turns out Ben was completely right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, the Atlanta uh, homestead. Even even if you know these matches aren't terribly interesting, it sounds like they definitely are spicing it up with some like funny little, uh, you know, grand uh, what, what do you call like all stars kind of type yeah. events. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, other than that, is there anything else we want to touch upon this week? No, I mean, just that, you know, Mangachu and Logics are, you know, Mangachu's in Overwatch League. Come on, that's crazy. Like, you know, Toronto is doing so much fan service right now. Like, even though they're not winning matches, they're, like, you know, they just signed um, uh, mistakes to their uh, academy team because they brought up um, uh, Mangachu and Logic, so they had open mm. uh, spots there, and they had um yeah you know, like they're, they're you know like sort of, this is like the like i mentioned toronto is like the fan service team of mm. the expansion team like they're you know they're bringing on all these like fan favorite players they have uh you know i also had gods recently come in like they're, they're, they're you know they're they're doing the uh, you're doing gods work right, <laughs> so, right you know, exactly take all these 
nice, uh, you know, well liked uh, players within the scene and just like lifting them up. Yeah, and you can't blame them for that, even if they're not, you know, performing. <laughs> but a lot of a lot of these teams are just trying to like build a brand and make money. I mean, like obviously, you know, people aren't aren't happy to hear that that like you know these teams are businesses. Yeah, but, but it's like, like it's like any sport, really. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> If you can't win matches, you have to like win fans, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's like even like at Atlanta, they're top with the uh, yeah. bits on Twitch, and it's like I mean yeah, that's mostly because of Defran, but he's been gone for weeks. But it's like they've kept up this this fandom going. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably it for this week. Uh, make sure definitely to tune in next week because it's going to be interesting. Yeah, so thank you guys for watching. Uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and um, You know like the video share it if you want to with people and uh, You know stay tuned to, on our channel because we have a lot of really cool stuff coming out um, Brian has a lot of great podcasts um, that he's working on um, What else? Just like whatever you know whatever videos are available just go to our channel New videos. And just, just start at the top and just watch every single one. That's it. Anything that's available, watch it. Yeah. Uh, but make sure to follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Sharon, and follow Brian at the Fake Bmar and check to check out what he's doing with his uh, minor league uh, Tijuana team. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, everyone. Yep. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>